My name is Frank Mills. I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm a, a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and uh, a founder member of the IMECI COVID-19 Task Force. I'm currently chair of the Construction and Building Services Division and we have published information on COVID engineering onto the website under our section of that website on the IMECI. Um, also, I wanted to mention that I'm also a fellow of the CIVSE and a member of ASHRAE, and I'm a member of the COVID Task Force for all three organisations. So over the past year, I've done quite a lot of engineering developments, looking at how we can uh, make the world a safer place with the COVID virus in the air around us and on surfaces. So this is a short introduction into what engineering solutions we could have for buildings. And I'm going to uh, briefly explain what they are in these following slides. I think there's an agenda here which uh, really covers coronaviruses and what COVID-19 is. I'm not going to deal with that because Kath Noakes has, has already explained uh, what the virus is and how it's transmitted in her section of this talk. If you haven't seen that, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that. It's, uh, it's very good. It explains exactly how uh, COVID is transmitted between people and surfaces and so forth. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on hospitals and COVID-19 patients because I've done quite a lot of work in the past 12 months supporting the NHS with engineered solutions and uh, that's where there's a lot of application has been made but I also want to cover other buildings because we certainly do have COVID out in the community and it gets into all buildings and we really need to think seriously about how to make all buildings safe. So some of those lessons we've learnt um, in making hospitals safe can be applied elsewhere. I want to deal with reoccupation after lockdown because all those buildings that we used to know and love and have been shut for a year are going to reopen again. We can't just fling the doors open. We have to go in and check our engineering and maybe make some modifications to make sure they're safe. And that will be looking at the buildings themselves and their ventilation systems. There's also a question of what we should be doing to update after COVID. COVID is around, it's not going away any day soon, it could be here forever. It's a virus, there may be other viruses coming as well. We certainly know there's variants. What should we do to make sure that buildings are going to be safe? And in looking at that, what kind of competencies and training do we need to introduce for engineers and others? And what resources are available to help us achieve that level of safety? So my presentation is going to look briefly at the human environment and health. And we know that buildings are sophisticated these days. They have complex engineering systems and equipment in, and they need to work properly and effectively. Otherwise, they could in themselves be dangerous. Uh, COVID-19, what is it? It's a highly infectious respiratory disease that causes serious illness and deaths. And to me as an engineer, the clue is in the word respiratory. It's in the air and it enters the human body through the respiratory system. And once inside, it will do a lot of damage. So we really have to find out how to limit its uh, scope for entering our respiratory system if we want to be safe. Reoccupation after a long shutdown. Well, we really need to check, possibly recommission, possibly repair equipment in our systems. And we may have to upgrade the ventilation because COVID is now in the air or it could be in the air when it enters a building through a person and then there's reoccupation with covid still around what extra measures should we apply are our buildings that we know and love still as safe as they were or do we need to do something else well i think what we should understand is there's five stages of infection control and we're involved in most of those stages the first uh, thing to bear in mind is that COVID really walks into a community, into a building. It's carried in by a host person. There's no uh, scientific evidence at the moment that it's blown in the wind or anything like that. So it's more likely to come in in a person and that person is going to spread it when they breathe, cough, sing, shout as it leaves their, their mouth or their nose. So stage one is at the source, what can we do at the stores? Well, obviously wearing a suitable mask, maintaining a social distance between people and washing disinfecting hands to limit the spread of COVID is very important. And make sure the space we're in is well ventilated. 
So that's uh, available on the government website. And I think we're all um, fully aware of that phrase, wash hands, cover face, make space and ventilate. Stage two is the infection control and risk management techniques and equipment, which are implemented and installed by competent engineers. So what we need to do as engineers is identify high risk areas, wherever there's a risk of a person meeting someone who has COVID. All indoor places where people might meet and congregate, such as schools, restaurants, bars, theatres, sports centres, shops, churches, supermarkets, all transport systems, of course, care homes and workplaces. How can we manage people mixing and use effective ventilation, including the use of air cleaners such as UV, ultraviolet, that is, air sterilisers and air filters to make those places safe? That's stage three. And I would emphasise here, effective ventilation is an essential part of this engineering solution. Then we have stage three in the communities, and this is really something the government would apply rather than ourselves, although it does impact upon us in stage four, and that's widespread public health measures such as lockdowns, restriction of activities, limitations of numbers of people in spaces, obviously closing borders between countries. Such measures impose limitations on the normal way of life and impact on business and social interactions, so are only used when necessary. If step two is applied successfully, then step three may be relaxed or not used at all. And then, of course, we have stage four, which is infection through track and trace. Um, we will find out where COVID is and then we can backtrack to find its start source and go forward to find out where it's likely to spread next. And this is achieved by using highly automated systems through tracking data sources, mobile phones and such like. And they can identify whenever and wherever a COVID-19 carrier met others and for how long. And that's currently being applied, as you know. And then stage five, of course, is how can we design for living with COVID? COVID has certainly exposed weaknesses in our modern way of life towards contagious pathogens. We live with an assumption that the air is clean, outside air. We call it fresh air. Is it actually clean? Is the air in a building clean? And I would say, of course, that it's very difficult to look at air and say whether it's clean or dirty, it just all looks the same. And if infection occurs, we can rely on antibiotics or other medication to deal with it. Well, that's uh, no longer really true, although vaccinations are taking place. COVID has reminded us that nature is continually developing new diseases. And as in the case of COVID-19, they can be very infectious and harmful. So we've really got to make sure we use engineering solutions to live with these threats. And again, I, I'd come back to the fact that if effective ventilation is essential. So infections like COVID are spread through the air. Um, HVAC systems can as assist this spread or they can stop it, depending on how we design them and how they operate. They can certainly take an infectious agent from one person and spread it through the system to the rest of the building. Or maybe they can extract it out and take it away and throw it away or they can filter it out of the air. So HVAC engineers control indoor environments and therefore some of these effectors are factors affecting the risk. COVID-19 is spread by droplets and aerosols from the mouth and nose. Um, if we look at large droplets, which are generally above 10 micron, they're relatively heavy. So they tend to fall to surfaces around the person within three meters. And of course, because they don't die away straight away, they don't evaporate, uh, they can be touched and, and that in itself can be spreading the disease. But smaller droplets, which are less than 10 micron, um, typically 3 micron, 5 micron, they can float in an airstream and can drift quite a long way, I'd say 10 metres or more. Um, and in that case, they're airborne. We could be breathing them in uh, while we're some distance away from someone who's breathing out COVID. So um, the other point to remember is that large droplets can become small droplets um, because the moisture on them is evaporating and they then float away as aerosols rather than droplets. So we have to bear in mind that uh, in the air we've got the heavier droplet particles and we've got the lighter aerosol particles. I just mentioned here that uh, we've had a COVID task force running for over 12 months at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers uh, and this has produced um, a good design manual which is on the website and you're encouraged to go and, and look at that and I, um, I was a founder member really when I went to 
setting or strategy board and suggested to the other divisions and groups that they joined us on the construction division to develop guidance for all their parts of uh, mechanical engineering industry, which they did. So it's quite an extensive document. It's not just buildings, it covers trains and railways and so forth. If I go back to the stages then and we look at masks, we can consider different types of mask. And there is a British standard currently formed to look at the quality of masks. The first thing is to say face coverings uh, as a piece of cloth are not particularly good. They, they don't really filter out anything. So we really ought to have a good grade mask. So a surgical mask would typically be a very highly efficient mask. We've got to make sure it wear it, we wear it properly. Otherwise, the aerosols would just go around the side or through the bottom. And it's something we should always wear in an indoor public place where we're likely to spread the virus to other people. You can see on the diagram <clears throat> on the right, we could have um, a fairly low risk if the COVID carrier is wearing a mask and the other people in the room are also wearing masks. Very low risk there of transmission. But um, if the COVID carrier is not wearing a mask and other people are, there is a medium risk because obviously the aerosols are getting into the air and they're traveling around and there is a possibility someone's going to breathe those in. Uh, similarly, if the COVID carrier is wearing a mask and nobody else is, there's still a risk there of transfer. Uh, if neither is wearing a mask, then there's obviously a very high risk of transmission. And there have been several big outbreaks which have been reported like that. So what we really want to understand is that um, we, as engineers, we fit in with the medical professionals and the building operators to make sure that engineering infection control makes these places safe and we can live with COVID. So as I say, it's effective ventilation, not just any old ventilation, but effective ventilation. Um, we want to be able to use equipment that would kill a virus using ultraviolet light. Uh, bear in mind here, I'm using killing in the deactivating sense because it's not actually a living organism, but uh, make sure that it doesn't uh, uh, react with people. Uh, we want to remove viruses and bacteria from the air using filters. Uh, and one other aspect I want to mention is relative humidity, which is an area which uh, we, we don't promote very heavily in the UK. But there is evidence that uh, if we keep relative humidity between 40 and 60 percent, it's a zone in which uh, viruses uh, struggle to survive. And so we work with medical professionals who are looking at patient health and well-being. They follow clinical protocols and they rely on our engineering systems to help them do that. And we also work with building operators who are going to make these buildings function and safe for people. We provide the systems for them, we design them, we install them, um, and then we're looking for excellent performance. But we rely on those people to do that for us. Effective ventilation means that we want adequate ventilation required in all occupied spaces. We want ventilation uh, rates should not be reduced if occupancy reduces. But what we're trying to do during COVID is to maintain, um, to mitigate any risk of airborne transmission. So the greater dilution of air we can have, the better, because the viral load will reduce. And we want to look at guidance which increases fresh air rates to dilute and remove any COVID droplets. But that, of course, depends on the system and it would need an engineer to have a look at the system and decide what could be done. Could could we increase fan speeds? Could we put larger motors on? Is the ductwork big enough to allow greater air flows? So there's a whole host of questions there that have to be answered. But what um, guidance is being published is to say that we need to try and increase the amount of outside air going into a building, uh, pull it through the building and exhaust it with no recirculation. So that is obviously an energy impact, but the um, aim is to dilute the air in the building so that any particles that are around are minimized and removed. So we may be looking at COVID additional works. We, we could be adding filtration into the supply systems so that uh, it will take things out of the air, but that's only if the air handling unit allows. So. I'd refer you there to some ASHRAE guidance, which uh, talks about filter types and what kind of pressure impact they may have on the fan and the system. So, so putting a much higher grade filter in, for example, a HEPA filter, 
could impose such a, a resistance onto the fan that the air volume drops and of course that then doesn't give us the dilution we're after. We could alternatively look at ultraviolet air cleaning and there's some information there from ASHRAE. There's a short course actually that you could go to look at and that will tell you all about UV. Um, if you do use UV air cleaning, it should be possible to stick with the previous filters because the ultraviolet light uh, does um, severely reduce the number of uh, COVID particles or active COVID particles in the air. And as I said before, we could be looking at humidifiers to control relative humidity in dry climates, and that's covered later. Um, we should disable demand control ventilation strategies while in this mode because we don't want to reduce the air volumes, we want to maintain them as high as possible. And other advice is to bring in flushing periods before and after occupancy, typically two hours. So the building's flushed before anyone arrives with clean, fresh air. And after people have left, the building continues to operate to remove any stale air in the building for another two hours so that the risk of COVID particles being left behind are, um, are minimized. And of course, when we go to look at that, we can see that um, we can see that we might have to actually change the ventilation system for another one. If we find that what we've got won't give us these things and it can't work in a building, in our opinion, is unsafe. So not all buildings can be reoccupied exactly as they are. So one thing we do know is that outside air uh, cleans um, the air, outside air from the sun is cleaned by ultraviolet and this is coming from a study by the US Department of Homeland Security that uh, outside is fairly safe in summer so using this fact we could use ultraviolet to clean air as I mentioned before so this is one of the solutions that we could apply. Um, this diagram illustrates three ways in which this could be applied. The first one is an induct unit as shown there where the ductwork which is uh, supplying air into the space has a, a section with a UV lamp in it that's cleaning the air before it arrives so that will sterilize the air. The second solution would be um, a ceiling jet unit which uh, is a like a fan coil unit mounted in the ceiling but instead of having the, the fan coil parts it, it has ultraviolet lights and a fan so air is drawn over the ultraviolet light and then blown back down into the space a sterile air so that would basically be able to dilute a space and give it an effective air change rate based on the air volume being applied of that particular room and then those sort of units could be put into anywhere that had um, a full ceiling or if they haven't got a full ceiling it could be fixed to the solid ceiling and just continually recirculate the air, sterilizing it as it goes. And then the third option is on the far left lower hand, the mobile, where we stand a unit in a room. We draw air in through that unit and inside the unit, uh, the air is sterilized again by using UV lamps and is pushed back into the room as clean air. So again, diluting the air in the room. Just look at these in a bit more detail because as an engineer you'd have to look at the options and see which might be most applicable. So to put ultraviolet in uh, into a duct would require modification to the ductwork. You need a long enough section of duct to get that in. That unit you're looking there is, is typically 1500 to 2 meters long because the lamps have to go in the direction of the airflow. And whatever you do, do not use lamps that are perverse and perpendicular to the airflow because they will not uh, be able to function. They don't give you enough dwell time. They don't allow enough intensity for the air to be sterilized. So this unit I'm showing you has lamps which are uh, longitudinal in the same direction as the airflow. Um, you must have room for regular lamp replacement. The lamps last about um, 13,000 hours, which is about a year, year and a half. You need an electrical supply to those lamps and you must have safeguards because once you open this to do any work on it the lamps must go off because ultraviolet is dangerous to human beings. Um, the other alternative I mentioned was the upper 
unit ceiling jet which can be recessed into a ceiling or if necessary bolted onto the bottom of a, a solid ceiling. Um, and this one draws air up um, off the floor from the underside into the unit itself across the UV lamps and then blows it back along the ceiling and around which forming that clean pattern you can see on the right. So this is a typically a 600 square unit um, giving a, a clean air and this could be used one per room or several per room depending on the uh, viral load. And then the third option I mentioned was the mobile unit and this is a unit which could be stood on the floor and in this instance you can see it stood between two beds in a hospital area. It uh, draws the air in at lower level which of course is where the heavier droplets uh, and aerosols are falling to pulls it up into the base of the unit and then it's pushed up through the unit through across um, a vertical set of UV lamps and is blown out at the top there and the sides forming a, a clean air screen between those beds and basically diluting the viral load in that particular ward area. Just to a closer look at that just shows you the components there's a an air filter at the bottom. Now the air filter in this application is not intended to uh, take out all of the particles and aerosols. It's certainly not a HEPA filter, but we do need a good filter. So a G4 filter would certainly do this job and it's, its job is to remove particles so that the lamps keep clean. If we have no filter at all, then obviously dust and dirt will collect on those lamps and they will get dirty and they won't function properly. But if we can keep them clean, they will do 13,000 hours between lamp changes. So one maintenance job is to keep checking that the lamps are clean and maybe dust them down and change that filter. Um, so in this instance, the UV lamps are deactivating 90% of the viral content. It's a continuous process. It's continually recirculating the air and cleaning it. So gradually the air gets cleaner and cleaner. Uh, and the COVID load is reduced to a low level and gradually removed altogether. Now, there are lots of um, UV units coming onto the market and you will, as engineers, need to look carefully at these and make sure they do the job you want. This, this is one I was asked to look at, which has been imported from China. Um, this has exposed UV lamps which shine into the space. So in, you can see the clear glass at the front and the lamp behind it. Um, the idea is that as it shines out, it sterilizes all the first surfaces that the UV lamp falls upon. However, it can't actually clean the air because the air isn't going through it. But as I said before, it's a respiratory disease and the main source of infection is aerosols and droplets in the air. Uh, however, this won't touch those. It's really cleaning the surfaces that the UV light is shining on. Um, to make sure it's safe for people, it switches off when anyone approaches it. It has a occupancy detector on it. So when a, a carrier, when anyone enters. So unfortunately, when a COVID carrier enters, it also switches off. So it's not going to function when you most need it. Um, it won't see round corners, so if you look in that room, there's parts of that room it can't actually see, and they could be de de contact, they could be contaminated, and it will not uh, be able to deactivate that. Um, so you can't use it when people in the room, in including, as I said, COVID carriers, but you can't use it with anyone else either because um, UV is a risk, and it's not really an effective way of doing it. There's lots of other types on the market, so look carefully at them and see if they do do the job you want. And for a good read, if you like, on ultraviolet, go to chapter 62 of the UV, oh, sorry, chapter 62 of the Applications Handbook uh, that ASHRAE's published. Um, ASHRAE have very kindly made a lot of information freely available during this pandemic, and they have between four and 500 pages available on their website. Um, so this tells you that ultraviolet light sterilizes air by killing bacteria and viruses. It's harmful to humans, so must always be shielded from view, a view of uh, a person or their body. The UV performance depends on intensity and dwell time. This is not a, a flash in the pan type of solution. It needs time to work. Uh, so any air going towards these things must have um, time and it must have a slow speed. 
in fact, just to reinforce that, what uh, I understand as an engineer, and I'm an applications engineer, by the way, not a researcher, that I must be using UV light that's at 254 nanometers for the maximum effect. So that's really produced at the moment by fluorescent lamps. Um, LED lamps are working on this and they're trying to get something which will produce that. But at the moment, I think they're in the range of 220 nanometers, which is much less effective. So if you want maximum effect, you've really got to use a fluorescent lamp. Until, of course, the LED manufacturers are able to develop something at that range of 254 nanometers. Uh, the fluorescent lamps which uh, are used in the sort of products I've shown you have a life around 13,000 hours, uh, and then you need to replace them. The lamps need to be clean. They, they're not going to function effectively if they're covered in dust and dirt. So as I said before, a G4 filter or something around that is going to be okay. It'll keep the dust down and it needs to be checked monthly. Uh, dwell time is important, so the air must pass close to the lamps for sufficient time to kill the virus. It's no good if they're too far away, so I suggest a distance of about 100 millimetre as the air flows uh, along the lamp. Uh, it needs a decent intensity as well, so a typical good UV intensity would be 3000 microwatts per square centimetre. Um, it's best to draw air in at low levels where you can, so that mobile unit um, it's better if it pulls the air from the floor because that's where the droplets and aerosols are migrating to. That's the greater intensity. And um, when they have drawn the air through, they need to supply it at high level, which is where people are breathing. So the cleaner air is in the breathing zone. So what uh, some, some advice I might be able to give you is um, look at the UVA rating adopted by the International Ultraviolet Association. Um, try and get hold of UV units that have hours run meters on them so you can see how long they have been running. You know then when the lamps are likely to want replacement. Um, also get a unit that has a lamp failed signal on it so that you know it's time to take that lamp out. Otherwise you've no idea that it's not working. It's not doing any good. Um, so some of those units that we've looked at there and I, I know in some of the work I've done with the NHS looking at equipment by uh, a company called Mansfield Pollard we've uh, ask them to put on green lights which tell us that uh, the units are working fine and a red light meaning something's wrong I need fixing so that the, uh, the occupants of the room who may not be engineers they may be nurses or doctors or just office workers uh, know there's something wrong and they can call for maintenance which may be something simple like lamp replacement. Uh, now the other area we shouldn't forget is, is filters of course we could put high grade filters in such as HEPA and they remove 99.97 percent of 0.3 micron particles um, so they'll get most bacteria and viruses out of the air um, they will trap the load on the filter and then of course that filter has to be removed periodically and it is a biohazard it's they don't kill or deactivate the virus um, so it will be active on the filter and at the time it's removed it has to be done very carefully um, so as a biohazard that would be done with the room empty you wouldn't want uh, occupants in a room if you take a school classroom for example you wouldn't want the children sat in the room while the janitor is changing the filter because if he drops it you know the whole room's contaminated straight away um, so this is quite a serious uh, requirement and if you're going to use HEPA filters you've got to carefully think about how how you would do that uh, in these spaces <clears throat> and then the bat it has to be bagged up and taken away um, and disposed of as a biohazard the other point to remember is when the new HEPA filter is fitted it has to be tested as a HEPA filter if it's just slid back into the slot and air leaks around it then it's probably only 50 percent effective so it's, it's always important with a HEPA filter to install it properly and then have it tested using a DOP test or similar to make sure that it is actually performing as an installed filter. Uh, not not criticising the media itself, I'm just saying the frame and the way that's fitted could be leaky and that really take, negates its, uh, its performance. And then finally, just looking at relative humidity, and this is uh, a chart from uh, Dr. Stephanie Taylor, 
it, it shows really that uh, if we can get into that range of 40 to 60 percent in the middle of the graph there we have low infectivity from all those viruses and bacteria that are listed and this was produced before COVID-19 by the way but it covers um, it, all those other viruses and coronaviruses and flus and you can see they are are not uh, active in that central zone. Um, however, we in the UK don't tend to humidify or dehumidify our buildings. We have a, a temperate climate, so for much of the year we tend to be in that region anyway. But in the depths of winter, we may find the building become drier. 20%, 30% is typical. And we may want to look at uh, whether humidification is necessary. Uh, and in the peak of summer, we may be finding higher humidities. But uh, humidification is, uh, has other issues which uh, you need to discuss with maintenance staff, such as uh, making sure there's no Legionella spread if there's a water leak or anything like that. Now, stage three, as I said before, the lockdowns, and that really is controlled by government, and they prevent transmission by stopping us having contact with anyone else. We basically stay at home. Um, there are more waves of COVID transmission expected and they may continue to bring in lockdowns. There's also a threat of COVID variants so that uh, as a new variant comes along, it may be necessary to have a look at uh, another lockdown. Uh, we do have COVID vaccines coming in, but they are not likely to eradicate COVID, but they, they could reduce the risk somewhat. Um, the stage four is really another area that we engineers must step up and that's because buildings have been locked down for a long time, you know, nine months, 12 months. And as they start to become reoccupied after COVID, we have to make sure they're safe. So we need to carry out risk assessments on the buildings. <clears throat> we need to look at uh, training and behavioral changes that may be needed. For example, uh, in lifts, the uh, current guidance is to only have one party or one bubble. That's a group of people who are known to each other and live with each other who could get into a lift together. So don't get into a lift with a group of strangers. Don't crowd into a lift um, because if someone in that lift has COVID, then everyone will get it. So those are behavioural changes which we uh, have to look at. Or, or we could apply some engineering to the lift, put in an air steriliser, as I showed earlier, using a UV unit. And then maybe we could have more people in the lift because the air is being cleaned and the viral load's being kept down. So as part of this work, and as I say, there's a lot more on the website, we want to look at cleaning, repairing, maintaining, checking, and possibly recommission all of the engineering systems, not just the ventilation water systems as well. We want to introduce any equipment that could reduce infection, infection control measures. And that may be looking at some uh, UV air sterilizers going into the spaces or maybe some filtration. And we want to upgrade ventilation systems to provide future protection, more air through the spaces. And we want to maintain effective operations. The risks, of course, of not doing this are we're going to get sick building issues due to lack of use, build up of dust and dirt. Uh, plant and equipment may fail on us. Security may be compromised because things uh, have been uh, got at. Uh, could be fire safety issues. It could be energy wastage happening. Um, in fact, uh, one of the issues with some of the current ventilation guidance to go to full fresh air is that we will be using a lot more energy. And so we perhaps ought to be looking at introducing recirculation, but with uh, UV air cleaning. Uh, in order that we can uh, recirculate some air because we can't really continue to use large amounts of full fresh air going through a building. It, it's using a lot of energy and costing us a lot, a lot of money. And particularly in this year when we're starting our progress towards net zero is not going to be helpful. So some of those engineering solutions will help us to reduce energy waste, reduce carbon and save money. Um, so there is that risk as people come into the building that someone with COVID will walk in, it gets transmitted. And so we have to look at how we can deal with that. Um, and as added to this, we might find that occupant productivity becomes affected by enforced changes. So we have to look at how we can uh, minimize that. Uh, stage five is designed for living with COVID. If we look at this as a long-term issue, 
and it's here to stay and we expect future variants what should we be doing we we know lockdowns are expensive so don't really want to continue with those they're unhealthy uh, so we want to get everyone wants to get back to normality whatever that is the new normal we want to reoccupy our buildings and maybe we want to reoccupy them and use them in some other way but nevertheless we certainly don't want large um, high value buildings being sat empty and we want to be safe and healthy we also want to meet people in a safe manner and so we are beginning to see new buildings emerging this is one from chicago's it's um, billed as one of the first post covid 19 structures designed with enhanced air filtration it's got widely spaced offices and other touchless features in other words um, less chance of spreading the virus by touching things and also through uh, better clean air so what we're proposing uh, with this task force now is to move on to a cpd program where we can help to train and educate and spread information to engineers uh, and then those engineers can be relied upon to be competent to go and look at buildings and to establish what needs to be done and, and oversee that work in fact so cpd we're proposing will uh, verify competence it will give assurance of course to the government and the public at large that we engineers are making these buildings safer uh, we will maintain effective infection controls in those buildings of course um, it would also elevate our reputation among peers in the workplace because we are being seen as the profession that's putting these buildings back into good use and so we're looking at this uk-based cpd program which we are expect to start fairly soon it will give you instant recognition uh, real time and of course third party verification that you're able to undertake this work and as an infection control engineer you want to be qualified and have experience in ventilation for safe and healthy premises you will need to understand the science and people like Kath Noakes um, will explain that um, what is COVID virus what is it tra the transmission routes you will know the solutions what you need to do to protect people in their spaces you'll be able to go to a building and carry out site checks investigations identify what are, are the problems and produce a report on that uh, identify the solutions and once they're done oversee and sign them off as complete now, that is some references to this which you can have a look at in your own good time and uh, i will ask for any comments and questions if you want to send them to the IMACE, i will deal with those so i hope that's been useful it identifies what our plans are as the institution to help you become more qualified in infection control engineering thank you